Ah, oh, it's the happy dance. That is the happy dance. Wow. Yep. Hey, guys. Um, so don't leave me up here, all right? Uh, this is going to be one of the harder messages I've ever preached in my life, not because I'm not ready and, and all that, but just there is, um, as you might imagine, a little bit of emotion, a little bit of emotion, good emotion. And uh, I'm just right now kind of seeing where your new seats are, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, soft ones. All right, there we go. That's good. Duck, Mark, yep. And that, that was your biggest decision today, right? You walked in, you're like, I just, honey, I just don't, I mean, I'm not even worried about the kids checking. It's just where is my new spot <laughs> going to be? Uh, traffic team, that all went good. Parking team, you guys found a parking spot. This is good. Um, the walk was shorter as compared to Lake Park West. That's what I hear. That's good. All right, I'm supposed to start my message, and I'm going to do that. Um, I just think it's really important. There's so many people I could name right now uh, to give some credit to and some honor to. Uh, you guys know who you are. Uh, I've talked to you individually, but it's, it's really, really important just before I start this message for us to give credit and praise to the one that has literally done all of this. You gotta understand, eight years ago, 30 of us were in my living room. This is not something we've done. This is something that Jesus has done. And so I think it's important. We give credit and glory to him. And, <clears throat> all right, let me pray for me um, and for you. And then I'm going to, we're going to see what God wants to say today. God, we love you. Jesus, receive the glory. We're just, we're, I'm trying with everything I got in me. Just, just take it, give it. We give it to you. We love you. This idea has always been we know straight from you, imported from the throne room of God, the dream of Mission Church. And so God, we love you, we thank you. And now God, I'm asking for a, a really big prayer. Would you help me be here? Help me sense the way you're moving today, speak through me. And God, I also ask a big prayer for my friends today. There's a lot of new things and easy to look at a screen or the lights and just kind of be distracted and not hear from you. And more than seeing a new place and seeing a new building, God, I'm asking through the power of your Holy Spirit that my friends would hear even new dreams from you. And so, God, we're going to lock in for the next 30 minutes. We expect you to speak. We promise to listen and obey. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, as you guys already know, uh, it is week one of the new year. Uh, right? It's week one of the new year. And, and every single new year, what we do is we make lists. We call those lists, what? New Year's, New Year's resolutions, right? And so we make these lists and we list off things we're going to start doing and stop doing, okay? And I'm not going to ask you how that list is going one weekend, but I just want you to think about it, right? So we, we say, all right, we're, we're going we're gonna to stop sleeping in so late, we're going to get up early. We're going to stop staying up so late, right? We're going to just say no to Netflix. We're going to go bed on time, right? We're going to reduce sugar. We make these lists of things we're going to start doing and stop doing, right? And the reason we make these lists is we want to live a happier life. We want to live a hel healthier life, at least some, right? Most of us, probably all of us, want to live a longer life. And so we make these New Year's resolutions and we formulate our list. But here's what's interesting to me. There is one thing I would argue is probably not on any of your lists, Yet, it is the one thing I believe is causing more death before death, and that is living life without a dream. Living life without a dream. God knew that this would be one thing that we'd forget to put on our list. God knew this would be the one thing that we would forget to ask him about, God, what is your dream for my life? And so this is what God's word says to us, Proverbs 29. Let me read this to you. Really important, right? Proverbs 29 says, where there is no kazon. I, this is your first opportunity to say Hebrew uh, in, in this new building. Kazon, you need to kind of spit on the person in front of you, right? So we're going to try this really loud, all right? You get one shot on the count of three. Kazon, on the count of three. One, two, three. Kazon. All right, now I'll apologize to the person in front of you, right? God's word says where there is no kazon. Now, this is not calzone, okay? This is kazon. Where there is no kazon, it says the people will perish. What does this word mean? This word me means where there is no vision, that's what it means. It means where there is no dream. That's what it means. It means where there is no revelation that we are receiving from God. God says, if you don't have that, you will not have life. 
Now, you might be existing, but you won't be living. He said, where there is no dream, where there is no vision, where there is no revelation we're receiving from God, the people perish. The one thing I want you to know this month is this. God has a dream for your life, and he wants you to live it. The person sitting in your chair, no matter what you did last year or last night, God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one that moved mountains and did miracles that get us into this space today somehow. That God, the one that formed you, the one that saved you, that God, he has a dream for your life. And he doesn't want you to outsource that dream for someone else to live. He wants you to live it. God has a dream for your life and he wants you to live it. That's true for you, that's true for me, and that was true for Joseph. For three weeks, we're gonna be looking at the life story of Joseph. Everyone say Joseph. Joseph, right? So this isn't Joseph in the New Testament. This is old school Joseph, uh, Joseph in Genesis. And his story, most would believe, is one of the most incredible stories in all of the Bible. Uh, He comes from a family that's a really big deal in the Bible. Uh, He comes from a really big family as well. Uh, There's 12 sons in this family, all right? So he had 11 other brothers. Uh, I'm from a family of three boys. I have two older brothers. We broke everything in my mom's house, okay? Just now, she's able to buy nice stuff because we're not in the house anymore. I want you to imagine a family of 12 boys. So this is Joseph. Now, he's not the baby, he's not the runt, he's not the youngest, but he's the second, right? So he's the 11th in this family. Uh, Their dad is a pretty big deal as well. Uh, His name is Israel. Israel, maybe you've heard of that before, Israel. And some of you have heard of the 12 tribes of Israel, and we might wonder, how did they come up with 12? Why not 24? Why not 18? Why not five? Well, it's because the 12 sons. And so their dad, Israel... He has 12 sons. One of the sons is Joseph. It's interesting that in Genesis, Joseph, his story, takes up more space than anyone else's story in all of Genesis. More than Abraham, more than anyone else in Genesis, the writer gives Joseph's life story more real estate in the book of Genesis than anyone else. And so what we see happening in his story in chapter 37, I want to paraphrase it for us just a little bit. We see some really important things. Uh, His dad uh, gave him one day a really nice coat. Uh, some of you have heard of uh, Joseph in the Technicolor dream coat, perhaps. Really a popular thing, right? Um, I'm not sure if it was like Technicolor, but it was definitely a coat of many colors. It was a beautiful coat. This coat represented royalty. It was a foreshadowing. It was saying that one day you're not going to be in Canaan. One day you're going to be in a palace. It was a coat that also reminded his dad of how faithful God had been. Finally, at last, God did a miracle, and he gave Israel a son through the wife that he treasured. And so that day came. When the dad, he, he said, uh, Joe, come here, man. I've been to men's warehouse. I picked something out for you really, really nice. You're going to like the way that you look. And, and he, he, I think that's how it went. And, and he puts this robe on him. I want you to imagine what that must have felt like for Joseph. And as you can imagine what that must have felt like, that's what it actually feels like to be saved to be treasured by God, to be robed in righteousness, to be favored by the Father. And the dad, this was a terrible parenting move, but he robes him in this coat that differentiated him among the rest of the brothers. Now, some of you grew up with siblings, and you know what happened in your house when when you got something that someone else didn't get. I want you to just imagine this times a billion the, the older 10 brothers, they, they didn't like this at all, as you can imagine. And chapter 37 is the plot. It is the, the, the foundation of this story that we're going to look at. But instead of reading all of chapter uh, 37 to you, what I want to do is zero in on just one verse specifically. It's verse 5. And in verse 5, we see two things that we got to see as we begin this journey through his story. The first thing that we see is the conception of Joseph's dream. If you're taking notes in the church app, this is, this is number one. I'm going to give you a little fill in the blanks because you love fill in the blanks, all right? The conception, everyone say the conception, the conception of Joseph's dream. Now, if you know the story, you know that this dream would carry him to all kinds of amazing places. This dream that God gave him, it would carry him far from Canaan. Eventually, it would carry him to Egypt. He would no longer kind of just be wandering around. Joseph would be in a palace He would become the second most powerful person on planet Earth. Little Joe would. All right, now this wasn't 13 years later, but but he would become that. 
We got to see in this story, yes, where the dream carried him, but the thing we have to see above everything else is where the dream comes from. This is really important. Look there in verse 5. It says this, one night Joseph had a dream. One night Joseph had a dream, right? One night Joseph had a dream. Emphasis on had, right? This is my, okay, this is a first. This is, my, this is my prop. This is my teaching TV, all right? One night, this is fun. I'm going to stay focused. I've got major ADD. Um, we're going to put the Bears game on this a little bit later this afternoon. <laughs> See, they told me not to do what I'm doing because I'll lose track of where I'm at. But one night, Joseph, yes, one night, Joseph had a dream. It does not say one night, Joseph created a dream. It does not say one night, Joseph closed his eyes and said, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to make a dream for myself. We have to see, this is the most important thing as we start this story, we have to see that this dream came from the very heart of God. It was conceived in the very heart of God. What does this mean? This is what it means. The dreamer is Joseph, but the dream giver is God. The dreamer is Joseph. Let's be clear on that. But we got to be clear that the dream giver is God. God has a dream for your life, and he wants you to live it. God is the dream giver. One of my favorite things in the world is to hear from you guys dreams that God puts on your heart. Last night at dinner, me and Kel were were having a hot date. It was hot. It was a hot date. And we were talking about this very thing. And and I was just, and she knows this about me, but I'm like, babe, there's like a few things that make my heart come more alive than when I hear someone say to me, I think think God's like giving me a dream about something. I was telling her, I was reflecting on dreams I've been hearing over the past decade from some friends of mine, a buddy of mine named Blake, who, who's part of this church. I remember him saying, John, I don't know what this means, but I feel like I'm supposed to leave the business world, and I just got to start investing the best hours of my day into the next generation. I think I'm going to like do these like hard obstacle courses. I'm like, that's never going to work, and uh, I'm going to make them lift heavy things, and now that dream is called battle-tested. I, I remember Hannah as an 18-year-old saying, I feel like God's given me this dream to be an advocate for my generation. I just believe we're supposed to be a distinct generation. And not only that, I feel like I'm supposed to write and become a published author, right? And I think it was last week, like her book is done. She's now 23 years old. You've heard her speak here or you've seen her play in the keys. I think about all kinds of dreams that you've shared with me. I remember Mark and Andrea Wittig. Mark is somewhere running around solving problems right now, wherever he's at. Um, But Mark, if you can hear me, I I remember when you said, John, God's given us a dream to adopt internationally. And now that dream has a name. We've, we've seen him running around <laughs> in our home and, and in this church, seeing this incredible little boy, seeing that dream become a reality. So many different dreams I've heard from so many of you. I see one of my best friends in the world, Ted Canaris, in the back. Teddy, your, your beard is on point today, brother. It looks so good. <laughs> Um, you guys know Ted, he has preached at, well, not here, no one's preached here, well, I guess I am right now, but <laughs> Ted has preached at our church before, and he'll, he's one of my best friends in the world, and I love you, Ted. Uh, you are a gift in my life. And I remember when we were having breakfast, and I remember when Ted looked at me across the table, and he's like, I just feel like God's given me and Melissa a dream, we got to go plant this church in Downers Grove. And now they're here with their entire team this morning to celebrate and be with us. I think that's a pretty cool thing. And God is growing that church and he's building that church in Downers Grove as it is in heaven. I'll never forget when you shared that dream with me. God has a dream for your life and he wants you to live it. I remember when Tommy and I used to prayer walk around this building years ago, like years ago. And we'd walk and we'd pray and then our leadership team, we started talking about this building and we just said, maybe God's given us a dream for this building. Like, and we looked at the building, and, and I, I felt like, I think God is giving us, like, how much do we all love lazy boys? I think he's speaking to me, <laughs> at least. There it is. I mean, he put it in lights. Lazy boy, right? It's when I feel closest to God, when I'm reclined. <laughs> you know? And here we are today. And you're like, you're, you're sitting in God's dream. That's, that's where we're at right now. I love dreams from God. I love hearing about your dreams. And one thing, dreamer, as you begin to dream God's dream for your life, you need to know that the the, the parts of your dream, the aspects of your dream, they're just going to be different than other people. All right, there's going to be aspects of your dream that are just different, and that's a really good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's something that you need to know. The particulars of our dreams are going to be different. 
Think about some of the greatest dreams ever dreamed when Moses received his dream from God, right? To to represent God and to lead God's people out of slavery. Now, that dream was very different than Nehemiah's dream. The particulars are very different. Nehemiah, he wasn't leading people out of slavery. No, it was a construction dream. I'm going to build this wall. God's given me this dream. But that's very different than Esther's dream. God gave her a dream to be a queen, yet God gave Mary a dream to be a mom. The particulars of the dreams are very different. For some of you, he's going to give you a dream to be a mechanic. For some of you, it's to be a teacher. For some of you, it's to be a pastor. For some of you, it's to be a stay-at-home mom. For some of you, it's to be a missionary overseas or to be a missionary in your high school. God gives us all kinds of different dreams. The particulars are different. But the point, the point is the same. The particular of our dreams are different, but the point of our dreams, the outcome of our dreams, are all the same. Represented in this room and watching online are thousands of dreams, different dreams, yet they all share the same outcome, if your dream is from God. And that one outcome, that one point, is to be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Some of you right now are not happy. On the way here, your wife is saying, I think we need to have more kids right? All right, so this isn't what I'm talking about, right? I'm not talking about procreation. That's for another topic, right? But this has always been God's dream for his people. The first words God spoke to mankind, be fruitful and multiply. Keep following the story of God and the people of God. What happens in the New Testament? Be fruitful and multiply. We call it the Great Commission. The Great Commission in one statement is to be fruitful and multiply, the Apostle Paul gives us more dimension on what fruit means. Some of you have never been to church. Like, he's, what, what is he saying? What do you mean I need to be fruitful? What does that mean? Here's what it means. The Bible answers it. It means to live a life full of love. Talk about the outcome of a dream. Talk about the point. It's to live a life of self-control. How many of you, or at least your spouse, would love to see you live that dream this year? <laughs> People are raising their hands. This is good. <laughs> the dream of kindness of gentleness. God has a dream for your life. All the particulars will be different, but the outcome is the same. Be fruitful and multiply. Jesus says, listen, this is why you need to abide in me. You need to remain in me. You need to stay proximate to me because if you do, then you will bear much fruit. You will live a fruit-filled life and you then need to multiply that into the lives of others. This is the outcome. This is the point. As we track along with Joseph's story, the platform God gave him wasn't the point. It wasn't the point. Don't start falling in love with platforms. That's not the point. The outcome was for him to leverage the platform. Why? To be fruitful and multiply. And literally through that, a nation was saved. This is what we need to understand. God is the giver of dreams. The outcome is all the same. Be fruitful and multiply. I'm told that we're going to have a grand opening I think it may have happened today, but we're going to have a grand opening on February 2nd and 3rd. February 2nd and 3rd. That's going to be our grand opening. That's going to be the day like, where we really invite, I guess, all of our friends. And uh, we're going to have uh, 32 services that weekend so everyone can fit. It's going to be great. I can't wait. Now, we're going to have three. And I'm excited. I really am. I'm excited for February 2nd and 3rd. But I'm more excited for February 5th and 6th. I've been dreaming for a long time that we could be given a building by God that during the week we would turn it into a dream center. I'm not sure what comes into your mind when you hear growth track, right? Maybe it's a Nordic track or things like that. (laughs) But what needs to come into your mind when you hear growth track is dream center. Tuesday night, step two, three, and four are gonna be here. I cannot wait. We're gonna be here. Why? We wanna grow intentionally. Why? We wanna discover God's dream for our life. And step two, three, and four, get ready. It is going to be electric on Tuesday night. I'm more excited about that than I am grand opening. And then Wednesday night, the 6th, that's alpha takeover. I mean, you're not going to be able to tell your friends that bring yourself and your kids. High schoolers are doing student alpha. On Wednesday nights, it is going to be people for the first time discovering God's dream for their life to be in relationship with them. I am excited for grand opening, but I am way more excited our growth track, as Dan said so well, would you take your step? We're not going to change just because our address has. We are sold out to seeing you grow intentionally, to see you discover and understand God's dream for your life. Verse 5, it shows us the conception of Joseph's dream, but also the cost, also 
the cost. The verse continues, Genesis 37. Yes, one night Joseph had a dream, but it continues. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Now, if you read this chapter in your own time this week, you're going to see that um, it started at a strong dislike when he got the coat. But then all of a sudden, Joseph receives a dream from God, and he immediately goes public. He was 17. He didn't know any better. He he rounds up his brothers like, you guys got to hear this. It's it's amazing. I had this dream, right? And in, in its agricultural language, right, it's about a sheaf and all this other stuff. But what the dream meant and alluded to is one day, guys, you're going to love this, 10 older brothers, one day I'm standing and the rest of you are bowing, right? (laughs) Who's coming with me, right? I mean, they were like taking swings at him. Then it goes from bad to worse to terrible. He had a second dream that he received from God. And he's like, guys, this second one, oh man, if you didn't like the first one, the second one, he's like the stars and the moon and like all creation were bowing down to me. Brothers, don't you love this dream? And so here's what we start to see happen in the plot. Yes, we see that this dream came from God, but we also see how much it cost Joseph. Before the dream would give him everything, and it would one day, it first cost him everything. And dreamers, some of you that have been dreaming God's dream for your life, this is where you're going to find yourself in the story. This is when you're going to be maybe moved to say an amen because the dream that God's given you, it has cost you. It's cost you dearly. You went public with God's dream for your life, the particulars and the outcome, and what you got was hatred in return. Three things that we see when it comes to his cost and the costliness of this dream. The number one thing is this. Those he thought would be his biggest allies became his greatest enemies. Some of you were so excited to share your dream that you believe God gave you. The particulars and the outcome of it, you shared it with family members waiting for them to be like, yes, yes. Instead, they said, no, not my son, not my daughter, not my brother. And one of the most difficult things for you has been this exact thing. You thought you'd have allies. Instead, what you got were enemies. The thing we see here is dreamers going to dream, haters going to hate. That's, that was for a few of my friends in the third row. Dreamers going to dream, haters going to hate. You start dreaming. Get ready to be hated. Why? Dreams that you get from God are oftentimes polarizing dreams. He thought he'd have allies. Instead, he got enemies. People are often offended by what you're doing or who you are believing God has called you to become. There's a cost to living the dream. The second thing we see is more than delivering comfort, God was developing his character. Oh, man, I've been learning this one for a long time. You see, he got this dream, and it was an amazing dream. Joseph was so excited at age 17, but what God didn't tell him in the dream was how long it was going to take. God didn't tell him, oh, and by the way, Joseph, there's going to be a 13-year plan to prepare your character so that you can actually carry the dream. You see, we don't like that. We like getting the dream, and then we want to experience the dream. Yet this is what we see in in like so many examples. This one might be one of the best. What is God doing? Has God forgotten? Is God taking a break? God, are you asleep? What is God doing? God, you gave me this dream. Have you backed out like everyone else? What's going on? Here's what's going on. More than delivering comfort, God was developing his character. Some of you have a big dream to be a mom. Some of you have a big dream to be a teacher. Some of you have a big dream to be an engaged grandparent. Some of you have a big dream, a lot of different big dreams, but here's the deal. God's got to get you ready to carry the dream. He's got to get you ready, and he wants to give you comfort. He is the God of comfort, but he's also the God who loves to develop character. I'm preaching, baby. Hmm. Genesis 37, at the end of this, listen what happens. Joseph goes public, he gets hatred from his brothers, and then not only that, they plot to kill him. They begin to think, we hate this dream so much that we're going to kill the dream by killing the dreamer. And so what they do is they devise a plan. And out in the distance, it says that they saw Joe coming towards them because they're out in the, in, the, in the field farming or with sheep or something like that. And so there he comes. And they say, here comes the dreamer. Let's plot to kill him. 
This is his brother's. And so what they do is they come up with a plan. We're going to strip him of his robe, and they did that. They take this ornate robe, and they rip it from him. Imagine the wrestling match. I grew up with brothers. Imagine the wrestling match. Imagine the blood. Imagine the fists. Imagine hair being pulled out. I mean, this was an attack. And they grab the dreamer, they strip him of the coat, and they throw him into the pit. A little bit of time goes by, and they're like, it, it, it didn't work. There was no water in there. We wanted to drown him, but he's still alive. All right, well, let's get creative. Well, they saw a caravan coming. They said, okay, here's what we're going to do to the dreamer. Uh, we're going to sell him. And his brothers literally sold him into slavery. 20 shekels of silver. Here is Joseph being sold into slavery off to Egypt. He goes, But the part I want us to focus on is the pit, is the pit. Some of you are hours into your dream. You've gone public with it, perhaps, and now you find yourself in a pit. Here's what I want you to know. The pit was a pit stop on the way to the promise. I'm about to preach. I'm just letting you know, like, this is the part I've been waiting for right here, okay? Like, all this is kind of an intro for this right here. All right, and maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one who knows what it's like to occupy a pit. Maybe I'm the only one in the house today that knows what it likes to feel forgotten by God. Maybe I'm the only one who says, God, I know you've given me this dream, but this feels like a nightmare. Maybe I'm the only one, but I don't think I am. And I know in this room right now, there are some of you that are saying, you know what, maybe I heard God wrong. Maybe I got it all wrong, but this is what you need to know. The pit was a pit stop on the way to the promise. This is what we see in some amazing people, right? Let me just give you some examples. Abraham Lincoln, he lost eight elections before he became president. He failed twice as a businessman. He had a nervous breakdown, yet he ended up on the $5 bill. Every time you take me out for coffee and and you put a five down, you just remember the pit was a pit stop on the way to the promise. How about the GOAT? Michael Jordan. It's an acronym for greatest of all time. I didn't think it yet. Greatest of all time. I stood on the court a couple nights ago. I'm like, this is where the GOAT stood. This is where he hit the jumper. The greatest of all time to ever pick up a basketball was cut from his high school basketball team. I mean, I I could have made Lake Park, right? He was cut. Winston Churchill. He failed the sixth grade. Now, this might not mean anything to you, but I also failed the sixth grade. I read that and I said, praise Jesus, there's hope for me yet, right? And I know, Mom, it was a decision to hold me back, but I failed the sixth grade. My counselors helped me with this. (laughs) How about Thomas Edison? We'd be in the dark today without him. He invented the light bulb. Listen to this. He tried over 2,000 experiments before he got it to work. Over 2,000. A young reporter asked him how it felt to fail so many times. To that, Edison said, I never failed once. I invented the light bulb. It just happened to be a 2,000-step process. (laughs) I love it. Some of you are in a pit. The dream feels more like a nightmare. And to you, I want you to hear this. Living the dream doesn't always feel like living the dream. Sometimes we're right in the middle of where God wants us when we're right in the middle of sorrow and setbacks. This is why you cannot confuse the presence of pain with the absence of God. God was with Daniel in the lion's den, and he was with Joseph in the pit. He was not alone, and you're not alone either. This is why we got to understand, we got to have vision that the pit was a pit stop on the way to the promise. I was thinking last week about Jericho. You start reading the Bible, the book of Joshua, this is an awesome story. There's this fortified walls, and God gives these crazy instructions. I want you guys to walk around them, because I'm going to make some stuff happen, God says. And so they start walking around. They put their sandals on. They do one lap, and I don't think it was a short lap. I think it took some time. They do two laps. They do three laps. I want you to imagine how bad, like there was nothing Dr. Scholl's about it back then. Imagine how bad their feet hurt. Imagine how humiliating this must have been. They're just walking around, waiting for God to do something. I don't know. It wasn't lap one. It's going to be lap two. It wasn't lap two. It's going to be lap three. It wasn't lap three. 
I think it's going to be lap four. It wasn't lap four. Imagine how humiliating this must have been. There was a cost to circling those walls, but I want you to imagine the greater cost. That would have been stopping at six. They didn't stop at six. It was on the seventh time around that God did what only God could do, and the walls came crumbling down. Some of you are ready to stop at six, and God wants you to, no, 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 no. No, you, you, you can't stop at six. You've got to have vision for the pit. And the reality is it's a pit stop on the way to the promise. God has a dream for your life. He wants you to live it. I asked our band if we could close our first service in here with a song that's really important to me. And so these guys are going to come out. They're going to get in position. The reason it's so important is because of one of the deepest pits we were ever in as a church. This goes back to 2012. Some of you know the story. We had just celebrated our one-year anniversary as a church at the middle school, like a block from here. And uh, we went to two services. We were pumped. There was momentum. This is amazing. God has given us a dream. The second week, I get a phone call at 5 in the morning from Tommy. Uh, Tommy says, uh, John, everything has been stolen. Go, what, do you, what do you mean by everything? What do you mean by stolen? He said, John, we don't know all the details right now, but our teams went to take all of our trailers. You see, we used to be a portable church. We might be again one day. But our teams went to get the trailers, and it was gone. Our brand new 32-footer, she was a beaut, a real beaut, was loaded up with everything that we needed to run a service. Tommy said, John, it's all gone. You remember this? <laughs> and he said, you keep working on your sermon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this out. I said, that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> it was a pit. And we got to the school that day. We, hadn't, we didn't have anything. We found some Christmas lights, strung those up. But what we did have is we had a great God who was worthy of our worship even at the bottom of a pit. And right before the service started, Tommy called an audible. He said, there's a song we have to do today. I know we didn't practice it. I know we didn't plan it, but we have to do this song. We have to sing this song in faith to our great God, and we have to sing this song to one another. We have to remember on this day in the pit that if God is for us, no one can stand against us. And so mission, I want you to stand to your feet. I want to remind you of where we've been. This hasn't always been a highlight reel. And your life will not be either. There will be pit moments. There will be times where the dream feels more like a nightmare. But it's in that moment, in the pit, we raise our voices. And we praise God because he's worthy, because he's with us, because he's mighty. This is our God and mission. I want you to sing this song for everything that you have. God in heaven, we worship you and we thank you. You are the giver of the best and biggest and most wonderful dreams. Cause us to dream again. We ask for this. We worship you and we love you. And all God's people agreed and said,